I am so pleased to introduce our speaker for this morning's annual Silver Lecture. The Silver Lecture is sponsored by donations made by Dr. Silver's patients for the purpose of disseminating information on clinical and research updates in the field of eating disorders. Dr. Silver did his pediatric residency at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia and his fellowship in adolescent medicine here at Children's National in 1969. He joined the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine in 1973 and is a GW tenured professor of pediatrics. He has edited several textbooks and published, published more than 200 articles. He is the medical director of the Donald Delaney Eating Disorders Program, and we are so very proud of the multidisciplinary team that has provided these services to children for several decades. We are equally thrilled that Dr. Silber has invited Dr. Ovidio Bermudez to deliver the Silver Lecture this morning. Um, Dr. Bermudez is the Medical Director of Child and Adolescent Services and the Chief Clinical Officer at Eating Recovery Center in Denver, Colorado. He holds academic appointments as Clinical Professor of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. He's board certified in both pediatrics and adolescent medicine. Dr. Bermudez is a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, the Academy for Eating Disorders, and the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. He is past chairman and currently senior advisor to the board of directors of the National Eating Disorders Association. He's co-founder of the Eating Disorders Coalition of Tennessee, co-founder of the Oklahoma Eating Disorders Association, and a founding member of Houston Eating Disorder Specialists. He's a certified eating disorder specialist and training supervisor by the International Association of Eating Disorders Professionals. Dr. Bermudez has lectured nationally and internationally on eating pathology across the lifespan, on obesity and other topics related to pediatric and adult health care. He has been repeatedly recognized for his dedication, advocacy, professional achievement, and excellence in the field of eating disorders. We are so grateful to have him here this morning. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bermudez, who will be discussing the dual diagnosis of eating disorders and diabetes type 1, mellitus type 1. Good morning. Can you hear me? It's the first time I wear one of these, so I feel a little bit like Sting, you know, right on stage. Well, I, I first want to say thank you um, to uh, this organization for the opportunity of coming to share some thoughts with you and uh, have a conversation or two that are very near and dear to my heart. But I especially want to say thank you to Dr. Silber because I, I believe he's one of those individuals who is an icon both where he, where he has lived and worked and thrived, but an icon in so many other arenas. And I think the name Tomas Silber means so much to so many people like me for growing up kind of watch them as a role model, and I am really grateful for this opportunity. So let's get down to this conversation. Um, I, I think that eating pathology is really evolving, and it's probably evolving because the way we live is evolving and becoming more complex and more complicated, and as you, I think, know, the whole notion of genetic environment interaction is probably really what drives this train. So those that are heavily genetically loaded, have had eating disorders for quite some time. And those who are uh, not as heavily genetically loaded are becoming more at risk simply by uh, the mere fact that we live more complex lives. So my sense is that the notion that anorexia nervosa was the only uh, representation of an eating disorder for uh, several hundred years, um, and that is morphing, is going to morph furthermore because of the way we live today. And one of those is this notion of um, medical comorbidities, right? The notion that people can use a medical illness that lends itself to manipulating weight in, in creative ways to actually stir their eating disorder. And so um, I'd like to share with you a little bit of, uh, of my thoughts around that. I have no conflicts of interest to, uh, to disclose. Historically speaking, it would be uh, interesting to say, well, why in the world would diabetes and eating pathology sort of cross paths, right? 
So rich history of, of diabetes. Uh, we have, you know, a couple thousand uh, years of history around it where when Arateos of Cappadocia sort of very eloquently said, you know, described it as the melting down of flesh and limbs into the urine. Fascinating still today. Um, it wasn't until much later in 1921 where Banting said, yes, I can keep this dog alive. Um, and then in 1959, so yesterday, in historical terms, we said, well, there's really two types of diabetes. And in a way, that's where we are today, in spite of our advances. Um, on the other side of the equation, uh, we've had several hundred years of history of, of anorexia. Um, Richard Morton first describing it as thesis nervosa, right? Um, I think historically really important because he said, yes, people in Europe were dying of thinness, but some would cough tuberculosis, and some would shuffle chronic syphilis, but some was really in their mind. They actually des described it as the uh, concerns and passions of their minds, um, and I think we're clearly there still today. Um, and then a few years later, uh, a French and a um, British this coined the term anorexia nervosa. In that, in that time, it was almost simultaneously a year apart. Imagine in today's terms, that was eternity. Um, uh, and in 79, Dr. Russell described bulimia as a malignant uh, variant of anorexia. I've, I've had the pleasure of um, hearing him sort of describe how he said, when I, when I see the 30th case of this, I am going to publish this data set. And when he got to the 29th case, he couldn't help himself anymore. And we, he went ahead and published it. And of course, it made it into DSM-3 in 1980. And what would say, why? why? Why would these two entities cross paths? Well, it's interesting that their incidence is increasing worldwide, um, both for eating-related pathology, not necessarily in the, in the prototypical illnesses of anorexia, bulimia, and binge eating disorder, um, but, uh, but for diabetes, both type 1 and type 2 are growing as well. And in many ways, it's unclear as to why. I mean, one would make an argument to say that uh, the increase in type 2 diabetes kind of makes sense with what's happening with the obesity epidemic in the world, but uh, the increasing incidence of type 1, one would say, well, not sure. And in diabetes care, there's certainly been a very significant evolution from uh, Dr. Kadish's uh, first insulin pump in 1963. To me, it looks like he's ready to go to the moon um, with this to, you know, really uh, continuous glucose monitoring, monitoring with what is as close to an artificial pancreas as we've been able to come. I think there's, there's much more to come um, in this. And, but there's certainly been an evolution of eating-related pathology as well. Um, and that's interesting that, in, you know, both fields in a sense are becoming more complicated. So, you know, we, ha we now have a plethora of, uh, you know, terminology, lay terminology, press terminology around you know, different manifestations of eating pathology and, you know, the athletes that become sort of over-focused on their athleticism and health and anorexia athletica, um, sort of orthorexia, or this, this focus on, on eating straight, right, if you will, um, anorexia or the, 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 the variants and manifestations in, in males of anorexia nervosa. Pregorexia, I think, is a fascinating subject. Right, and you talk about genetic environment interactions. So, how does a woman course life without having an eating disorder and then become pregnant, and then she develops an eating disorder or eating pathology of some sort? Um, I, I find that fascinating. The drunk correxia bit now termed inappropriate compensatory behavior to avoid weight gain and consuming alcohol. That's a mouthful. Um, so it's out there. Muscle dysphoria. We were talking a little earlier how. In a way, for men, it's about muscle dysphoria, and for women and men, it's also sort of twisting into health dysphoria, this notion that I have to be healthy, I have to live right, if you will. Um, many of you remember the caloric restriction for longevity movement. Um, smart, if you're a worm or a mouse, it works. Um, if you're a human being, it turns out that that's really not conducive. And of course, the term diabulimia. Uh, and diabulimia was really coined as a way of saying, well, the compensatory behaviors are really a mode of purging, if you will. Um, I think there's more to it than that, and, and I'll share with you even some nuances of what um, we've seen in this, in this arena. So to me, it's not a good term. We should probably leave it for the press. So the question is then, you know, what is a good term? Because this does describe, I think, a real syndrome, a real 
uh, um, uh, clinical entity that, that we see. Um, and uh, I think the field has landed, certainly in my opinion, it's a better term to say, to talk about the dual diagnosis of eating disorders and diabetes, or EDDM, um, uh, because it's more descriptive and I think probably more sensitive um, to how these people sort of think um, and feel about this. So back in 2009, uh, I was invited to a consensus conference. So there were a group of researchers and clinicians that said, you know, we see this enough that we should be coming together to say, what do we know about this? And how, you know, what, how do we develop some language that we can share so that the diagnosis and the care are elevated? Uh, so we met uh, at the University of Minnesota, uh, and the proceeds of that consensus conference were published in Diabetes Spectrum um, in the summer of 2009. Uh, and, and the reason for the choice was really that, uh, as we will discuss in a minute, I think this conversation is by far most important with our colleagues in, in the world of diabetology um, because uh, it's, they, are in, they have the best window of opportunity uh, to really look at early recognition and timely effective intervention, which as you know in eating disorders is really where we're at. Uh, if we let the pathology cement, uh, these patients by far <laughs> tend to course a more difficult uh, journey than if we recognize the pathology early and, and put uh, adequate measures in place. This group had an interesting conversation and said, look, uh, there are really two relationships here. The relationship of type 1 diabetes with eating pathology, and the relationship of type 2 diabetes with eating pathology. Since there are several groups throughout the world, including a group in Rio de Janeiro with whom I've done some work, that say, of course, there is a relationship with type 2 diabetes in the sense that binge eating disorder, especially of the weight gaining type, um, uh, it should be considered a risk factor for the development of type 2 diabetes. So if you're rapidly gaining weight because you're consistently binging, chances are that the metabolic derangement that follows includes some aspect um, of, of metabolic syndrome type 2 diabetes or could include some aspect of that. But the other important association, and the one that we're going to focus on today, is the association between type 1 diabetes in which uh, this entity should be considered a risk factor for the development of eating pathology. I hope I can uh, uh, leave you with a strong case uh, in that sense. So translation to me is, as a, as a pediatrician, as a family practitioner, um, you know, as a clinician out there in, in the front lines, I should be concerned about every diabetic that I see with type 1 and saying, I need to be attuned to the fact that this is a young person um, or not so young person in some instances that may be at risk for the development of eating pathology. So my hope is that this morning uh, we're able to discuss the definition, uh, the risk factors, the pathogenesis, a little bit uh, not so much is known about epidemiology, how this tends to present clinically and our management approach, which I don't think is the management approach, but it's certainly uh, one that uh, I, I think we've been thoughtful about. So definition. This was, a, this was an interesting conversation um, in trying to say, okay, what, what do we, how do we talk about this? So we landed on this definition, and it's a thoughtful one. Um, so this dual diagnosis is defined as the intentional omission of prescribed insulin, of course, um, by strategically decreasing, delaying, or completely omitting for the purposes of inducing hyperglycemia and thus rapidly losing calories in the urine um, and thus weight loss and or avoidance of weight gain. Okay? So the key there is we're not simply talking about sort of the black and white of I use insulin or I don't use insulin. The key is that the implication is that there can be a fairly sophisticated approach to insulin manipulation. Uh, with the common purpose, though, of, um, of weight manipulation um, and, and often the weight loss that follows. Now, from a clinical perspective, um, and I hope as, as many of you or all of you have sort of had a dialogue with somebody with anorexia nervosa, um, you know, for, for example, um, is that there is, there is this sort of entrenched sense of, you know, weight is driving my bus, right? And I think, and, and in a sense, weight loss in anorexia is a difficult task. It's not an easy task to accomplish. The challenge with this group of patients is that 
this insulin manipulation is a highly effective way of weight management, right? These people lose weight and lose weight quickly. Um, so that, you know, when you couple that with, 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 you know, a mental illness now, this becomes quite a challenge to uh, convince them otherwise. So insulin manipulation, what do we mean by that? Well, there are several forms. The first is disabling insulin. The people who are saying, look, I'm being monitored, watched, and I want to make sure that the insulin is disabled. So I use insulin, but it doesn't work, or it works less uh, than it's supposed to. Heat exposure does it, and, and microwaving does it. So I've had several patients talk about the fact that, you know, an insulin vial has a lot of silver material in it, so you can't zap it for a long time. But if you zap it as long as seven to eight seconds, it's just a few sparks, mom and dad don't find out, right? The insulin is disabled, life goes on. Impairing absorption of even, even uh, adequate insulin uh, is, is, is quite a sophisticate, sophisticated endeavor. Um, they can choose to inject in areas of atrophy or in duration. I'll show you an interesting picture around that. They can do what is called leaking the shots um, in, in fairly sophisticated ways. So kids have taught me that they can do it two ways. They can do it going in, right? So the insulin is set and they're going in, but they're, they're, they're leaking insulin as they're going in. So what goes into the subcutaneous space is nothing. Or they can do it on the way out. They can actually put the, the, the filled insulin syringe into the subcutaneous space and then leak it as they pull it out. So it doesn't, it ends up in the dermis, you know, or on the skin rather than uh, in the subcutaneous space. So it's fascinating that an experienced nurse can watch this kid and say, I saw them do it. They did it. They had their insulin. No, they didn't. Um, uh, Underdosing for vengeance is sort of another way of manipulation. So, so uh, diabetics that use their insulin appropriately, but if they feel they binged, and that could be subjective or objective. An objective binge, we would all agree if we watched, if we witnessed it, we would all agree a subjective binge speaks to, well, they felt their overage. So for, for some people, that's a bag of cookies. For some people, that's two cookies. Uh, but if they feel that that's the case, they may underdose or withhold their insulin and, of course, pump manipulation. What can they do with a pump? Well, they can do a lot. And it's part of the reason why, uh, as we'll talk a little later, part of our pr clinical protocol is that patients that has intentionally misused their insulin uh, need to come off the pump when they've become ill enough for treatment. Now, that's always a friction, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's something that has been ingrained in them that pump care is best care. And families sort of get to, well, how could this be? How could you, how could we go backwards? And sometimes it's important to go backwards in, in order to fully go forward. So, um, so they, they don't bowl us with the pump for carbs. Um, they can change the basal rate, so essentially they're getting less insulin uh, throughout the day. They can suspend the pump, and, and generally speaking, in pump use, why suspend the pump? They can disconnect uh, the, the uh, pump from being able to deliver the insulin. So the pump is recording as if it was uh, delivering insulin, but it's really not. And of course, pump, uh, uh, insulin in the pump can also be uh, diluted or, uh, or disabled, if you will. So the it's sophisticated stuff, because again, uh, even for some of them, like in the disconnect, right, the pump records may actually show that insulin is being used adequately, which then tends to lend itself to that notion of, of mystery. My experience in eating disorders is that whenever there is a mystery, there are behaviors that tend to cause that, right? In medicine, there, there, there are a few mysteries. This, this woman was an OBGYN nurse, diabetic for a very long time, um, and, and pretty sophisticated in her use. So um, uh, her husband was also a physician and who became highly suspicious, and uh, she resorted to using what, what they call dead spots. So, you know, by continuing to inject insulin into that particular area of induration and, and um, atrophy, um, the reality is, is that uh, insulin delivery, delivery was erratic at best, um, if you will. So it becomes a, a bit sophisticated. Manipulation of blood sugar readings is also, I, I think, interesting. Again, uh, part, of the, part of the dilemma with continuous glucose monitoring, this is, of course, much more difficult. Uh, but when they're doing uh, readings by hand, uh, they can use control solution. They can use a drop of alcohol on the test strip. They can dilute blood with water to sort of mask the hyperglycemia. They can use substances like orange juice. And ketchup happens to read at about 175 <laughs> micrograms per deciliter. 
um, of, uh, of blood glucose and readily available, and it's red, so it's, 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 it's sort of convenient um, from that perspective. What can we say about risk factors? Well, um, there are, the thought right now is, is that the experience of developing type 1 diabetes in many ways is, is, a, is a lesson on weight manipulation, if you will. And many of these young diabetics will tell you this. Yeah, I started misusing my insulin when I was 15, but the reality is, is that when I was six, I sort of knew this intuitively at some point. So uh, weight loss at the onset of insulin deficiency, weight gain with uh, initiation of insulin therapy, uh, those with type 1 diabetes have a tendency towards slightly higher BMIs compared to their uh, peers. Uh, the dietary restraint that we've come a long way, right? Just in my clinical time, uh, having type 1 diabetes meant real diabetic restraint. That has changed. But there is still meal planning, right? And there's still uh, carb counting. So in a sense, there is a, there is a numerical focus on food that for many temperaments is sort of irrelevant. I mean, okay, yeah, I calculate my, my, my carbs, so what? For some temperaments, that, that becomes sort of the nudge towards the um, mindset of numbers are very important and the like. Um, this issue of learning the regulated eating, right, based on external cues is an important one. So in a sense, it's a bit of training towards ignoring fullness and satiety uh, cues, right? Once the insulin is in, well, you gotta eat. Um, and that becomes the driver. Uh, exercise for uh, glucose uh, management uh, is also important. Uh, you know, many diabetics are very sensitive to this. Um, so they, it's an association, right? Cause and effect. If I exercise, my, my diabetes is better managed. If I don't, my diabetes is in trouble. Um, ability to deliver insulin. Uh, so it, it, essentially the, the omission strategy is something that they uh, have at hand and understand it. And there are more mood issues, mood concerns in young people with type 1 diabetes uh, compared to the general population, and in some studies, uh, two to two and a half fold. Um, so, so that's important to sort of, you know, keep in mind. And of course, they live in the same world we live in. So, right, the, the, the messaging about body size, body weight, beauty ideals, and the like, it, they're just as exposed as the rest of us are um, to, to these notions. The pathogenesis is interesting, and um, the first model uh, of pathogenesis that was published was published out of the Jocelyn Diabetes Center in Boston by Anne Goebel Fabry. Uh, I think that there is now, since 14, we've sort of moved to this modified dual pathway model in which the straight, uh, the, the solid arrows speak to sort of the well-established pathways, right? <clears throat> the diagnosis and the use of exogenous insulin tends to lead to uh, weight gain, um, of course, weight gain in our context especially leads to body image concerns, um, and, and the negative affect that, is a, that accompanies this eventually leads to disordered eating behaviors. Um, and then the duality comes from uh, the, some of the other understandings that says that, wait, dietary restraint or a dietary regimen that can lead to a sense of, not even real, right, it, it, a perception can become reality a sense of dietary restraints tends to make these people sort of bingy. Like, like most of us, our brains will deal with any sort of deprivation or sense of deprivation. Uh, and that has its own challenges. And of course, the, the biological aspects of diabetes that really impact hunger and satiety cue disruption, right? So it's not just sort of the learned aspects of this, but there are biological aspects that we'll talk about in a second that compound this uh, and I think set up um, the stage, if you will, for a bit of the perfect storm. So there are three essential, uh, I, I think, uh, disease-based mechanisms that this modified dual pathway talks about as to how diet, type 1 diabetes may lead to uh, disordered eating behaviors. The first is, is what I mentioned earlier, the carb counting um, and sort of the imposed food preoccupation, the numbers game, uh, if you will. Um, the second is sort of the sense that weight fluctuations, uh, especially as they're associated with variable use of insulin, um, can lead to, to significant body dissatisfaction. So it's not just the mere fact that, that as a group you tend to have higher BMIs, but it's the fact that you've experienced the fact that, you know, just, just like weight loss has a neurobiological impact, well, weight gain has a neurobiological impact. 
Um, and so people that experience weight fluctuations tend to be more at risk to sort of connect to the notion of uh, the desirability of weight loss in a, in a social or social cultural context like ours. And of course, blood glucose uh, fluctuations tend to be associated um, uh, with mismatch insulin doses, excessive carb intake secondary to the sense or the reality of hypoglycemia, and then the results in weight gain. So they're, they're, they're set up for rebounding or bouncing around from a weight perspective um, is, is an important one. Additionally, we talked about the whole hunger cue derangement. There are, there are some things about uh, type 1 diabetes that are, uh, I think, important to understand as well because they are they're contributors to this whole uh, psychopathology phenomena. Um, the, the first is that um, the, the, the weight loss associated, we mentioned this, with the uh, endogenous insulin production uh, from beta cell disruption is, is an important, powerful experience. Weight loss for certain temperament types, for certain neurobiologies, for certain genetic loadings, it's a powerful driver um, of, of behavior and, and change. The, there is interruption of amylin production, uh, which of course disrupts satiety regulation, so hunger and satiety are biologically dysregulated, not just simply behaviorally um, dysregulated. So at the end of the day, the metabolic si signals to regulate food intake sort of become wacky. Um, and ghrelin is disrupted, ghrelin production is disrupted, so uh, the, the, the setup is really increased hunger uh, and promoting dysregulated eating. Uh, you know, some of that, so, so, so some of that binginess, right, it's not just about the sense of deprivation, it's not just a behavioral experience, but it's a biological experience as well. What do we know about uh, how often this happens? And I'll share a little bit of data with you, and, and not all of this is state-of-the-art yesterday's data. It's a, it's some of it is a little bit more data than that because I don't think that, that there is much more um, than this. So um, in this particular study, um, it was a three-site study. Um, they looked at, um, it's really a prevalent study, um, eating disorders were found to be twice as common in these teenage girls with type 1 diabetes as their non-diabetic peers. And they stratified this into full syndrome eating disorder, in which they found 10% uh, of their sample um, uh, in the diabetics versus 4.5% in the controls. And in the sub-threshold eating disorders, so when they were uh, moving in that direction, uh, then the 14% the in diabetics versus 8% in controls. So teenagers. This other group, uh, and, and uh, Patricia Colton um, and Gary Roden out of uh, Toronto um, uh, published this, uh, really found increased uh, disturbed eating uh, issues in preteens with type 1 diabetes, so as early as nine years of age. Um, and here they found that both if they looked at full syndrome and subthreshold syndromes of eating disorders, 8% uh, incidence uh, in uh, type 1 diabetics versus 1% in controls at this young age, which sort of makes sense, right? I mean, we, if we sort of think about how eating pathology ramps up from the preteen through the, through the teen years. So even in this uh, population, I think we need to be aware. In my way of thinking about this and talking about it with patients and families, if you pull some of the data that's available, I think we can say, look, um, the, the deliberate misuse of insulin um, grows over time as one experiences life with type 1 diabetes. So for preteen girls, it's about 2% of them misusing insulin. In the mid-teens, somewhere between 11 and 15%. And then in the late teenage years and early adulthood, as high as 30 to 39%. And so my sense is that this is where early recognition is critical. Right? If, you can, if you can pick it up here, uh, we would do probably a, a much better job than if we're picking it up down here. And, and what these patients will tell you in particular, right, is that in their context, the, the clinical folks, right, those that, that reach clinic health care for this are the tip of the iceberg because what they're telling you is that any diabetic they know in this age group is messing around with their insulin. That doesn't mean that they're all mentally ill. That doesn't mean that they have developed an eating disorder. But I think it means that there is an important um, sort of abundance of insulin manipulation in type 1 diabetics out there. Now, that's anecdotal. I, I can't prove that to you. 
that's what they'll tell me. <laughs> I mean, they'll look you in the eye and say, I'm, I'm not doing much different than the rest of my peers. It, I just it, it got too far for me. It, it, went, it went too far. This is an interesting study by uh, Pebler, um, published also in the diabetic uh, literature, uh, where they, um, they took a group of people, uh, disordered <coughs> eating habits, uh, in this, particularly in females for this particular cohort, there were ages between um, 11 and 25, 87 of them, and they actually followed them for uh, about a decade um, with a semi-structured diagnostic interview. And what they found was that on follow-up, about 25% had some form of eating disorder or weight control behaviors. Um, a third of them, uh, or a little over a third, reported intentional reduction or insulin, of, uh, omission of insulin, and there was a significant uh, correlation with disordered eating habits, insulin misuse, and early onset or rapid advancement of microvascular complications. Um, so again, it's not just the presence of, but the consequences of that I think become important. So in a sense, um, I think we can talk to families uh, clearly and patients in saying that, that you know, we, we do see an increased prevalence of both subthreshold and pool syndrome eating pathology Specifically in females, there's no reason to believe that in, in boys with diabetes this is different. But the reality is that most of the data is in females. Um, insulin omission or insulin manipulation tends to start early uh, in the preteen years, um, so, so much less common in childhood. That's often confusing for parents, as you know, right? They, they did such a great job taking care of their diabetes as a little kid. How could we be facing this problem now? Uh, and this increases with age um, and through adolescence and the college years, uh, much less common in adults. Uh, although I will tell you that if you ask me, is there a group that comes to mind? So in all the patients that I've seen with this dual diagnosis, if there is a group that comes to mind for me is medical students. So I've seen more medical students with type 1 diabetes who have clearly sort of taken that stance of, I know how to manage this. I'm smart enough to manage this and lose the weight. And then they sort of get, they, they cross the line into sort of the obsessive stance and become, um, you know, eating disorder uh, around this. So to me, it's an important group. And it's, and it's very telling in a sense because I think there is a sense of mastery, right, in this group. I really understand my disease. I, I really understand, um, you know, the, the, the physiology of my disease. I understand insulin use and I can beat it. I can actually use this to my advantage. And, and it often turns out to simply not be the case. Clinically, what do we see? Uh, what we, should we be thinking about? Well, um, if a person with type 1 diabetes loses weight, we should be suspicious. Um, and again, seldom is there a mystery in weight loss. Um, Poor diabetic control, elevated A1C, sometimes in spite of, of good care and good readings, um, recurrent DKA, episodes of DKA, that otherwise, especially, uh, you know, with, with a good diabetic care plan, one would ask, why? How come? Um, an early appearance or rapid advancement of uh, uh, microvascular complications. Uh, that Those, I think, are telltale signs that we should be sort of ear to the ground um, in this population. My sense is that we should be uh, sort of thinking about this before the symptoms uh, appear. Uh, so, so a little bit of screening matters. This is highly effective. We talked about that in, in weight loss. And this is um, uh, a study uh, also from Toronto where they followed um, 91 females ages 12 to 18 and that had a mean uh, duration of diabetes of seven years. So they had experience. Um, with insulin management and the like, and, and so um, it was, it was um, four years apart. So at baseline, 38% uh, dieting, 45% binge eating, 14% omitting insulin, and 8% were stuff-inducing vomiting. What happened four years later? They grew up a little, um, half dieting, half binge eating, and a third omitting insulin, no self-induction of vomiting. Why? Well, self-inducing vomiting is actually a relatively uh, ineffective method of weight control compared to insulin manipulation. So those, those uh, folks that, that had not yet, and those folks who had, were trying to manage their weight in this, in this group um, by, by self-inducing vomiting, learned that essentially that was not the effective way to manage this. So, so powerful driver um, if you become obsessed with your weight. 
and the like. The, the, mortality, the, the morbidity and mortality associated with this is important. This is a, um, a study from uh, also the Toronto group uh, that looked at with poor, with very poor diabetic control, there is a rapid acceleration of diabetic complications. As a matter of fact, this group may be different in a way, in, in a way that I don't understand. But for example, we see very, very fast shifts for the better when we treat these patients in their, in their glycohemoglobin levels, right? And, and sometimes in two weeks of better management, they drop their, their glyco percentage significantly, which in a sense, right, uh, I, I've, I've yet to sort of understand how that happens so quickly. Um, but so um, in, in this group of 91 individuals uh, at baseline, uh, four years later, same cohort, they found three times the rate of retinopathy if they had been manipulating their insulin. So it's a, it's a catalyst for rapid advancement um, of, of complications, of microvascular complications, if you will. And then the mortality, uh, I think it's something to really think about, if you will. Um, Nielsen published this uh, and, and, then, and then reviewed this paper. Um, and essentially, it was a 10-year uh, Scandinavian registry study. Um, and they were looking at, not at percentages or crude mortality rates, but death per 1,000 person years. And their findings were that for di type 1 diabetes alone, there were 2.2 deaths per 1,000 person years. For anorexia nervosa alone, 7.3. That translates into a crude mortality rate of approximately 6.5%, which is right along the lines of how we understand the mortality of long-standing anorexia. Um, but for the dual diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and anorexia, there were 34.6 person deaths um, per uh, death per thousand person year. So 17 times uh, in this particular finding of diabetes alone and five times that of anorexia. So actually the claim that anorexia nervosa has the highest mortality rate of any other um, psychopathology that we know today um, can be qualified to say that the dual diagnosis of eating disorder and diabetes actually uh, um, is, a, is a subset of pathology that clearly has the higher mortality rate way beyond that, that of anorexia nervosa. Um, so I think it's important to keep in mind as we think about this. And then management. <clears throat> um, this, was, this was part of the consensus conference. I think we wrestled with this a lot in, in trying to be good stewards of healthcare dollars. But the reality is, is that uh, anyone diagnosing somebody with type 1 diabetes who now develops eating pathology should be considered for in-hospital uh, or eating disorder a specialized treatment because of the high morbidity, because of the high mortality, and because the reality is, is that it's a little bit like bulimia in that sense, right? If you see somebody with bulimia in an, in an emergency room and you say, look, all your ailments will go away if you go home and you don't purge anymore, what is the chances that they're going to follow through on that? So what are the chances that this group of individuals, if you say, look, if you go home and you use your insulin appropriately, all your ailments will go away, what are the chances that this person is going to go home and do exactly that? So the setup is one for, um, you know, continuation of the behaviors rather than by psychoeducating them, uh, you know, extinguishing the behaviors. Part of the challenge there is, is that these people know what they're doing. They know exactly what they're getting into, right? So. The, the diabetic ed education program is one of the most um, well done um, uh, healthcare endeavors that this country has seen, right? It's consistent throughout the country. Um, you know, we really do it well. So some emergency room uh, uh, personnel sort of educating this group of people as to, look, you're doing some damage to yourself is old news. Um, so insufficient in a way uh, to alter the, the pattern of behavior. The management steps, I think, begin with a comprehensive assessment from a medical perspective. It's complicated because we have to sort of contend with the complications of diabetes, but this, people may be at, you know, 60, 65, 70% of their ideal body weight. So they have the medical complications associated with an eating disorder as well. So it's a little bit of a dual look, and you can't just focus on, you know, if they're in DKA, their bradycardia and conduction, cardiac conduction problems and, and the, you know, the, the profoundness of their malnutrition may be as important in, in sort of um, informing the case 
as just the diabetic complications alone and vice versa. Um, the psychiatric assessment is important. I think we need to remember psychiatric comorbidity in these patients. Depression uh, and, and anxiety syndromes are important, and the risk of suicide is, is no different than, as best we know, no different than from any other eating disorder population, right? It's a high risk of suicide. Uh, so safety concerns become an issue, and these are patients that live in this day and age, so that self-harm, self-injurious behavior, parasuicidal behaviors are also important, and they cut and they burn just like the other kids with eating disorders and just like the other kids with diabetes alone and not the dual diagnosis. Readiness for change is important. I think it's, it's one of the drivers. If, if, if we could accurately assess and develop a sense of their readiness for change, it may alter the way that we sort of approach this initially. But the reality is that in the absence of a very strong sense that they are indeed ready to change, I think we should, uh, just like when, in other eating pathologies, sort of assume that they're not ready to enter a process of change. Um, the risk of travel is important. Not all centers, right, are, are so, you know, if you're two hours away from, from uh, you know, Children's National Medical Center, you have to ask yourself, how safe is that travel here? You know, if you're, if you're going to Los Angeles or Denver, you have to ask yourself, how, how safe is that travel there? And I do think that it's really important, like, like in other areas of psychopathology, that we formalize the diagnoses, right? So you sit across from these people who've been in DKA, you know, 12 times in the last, you know, year and a half, um, and they've been in and out of the hospital, and somebody refers them for eating disorder treatment, and you ask, what do you have? And they say, well, I have diabetes and some eating problems, right? Far beyond, I think, the way we need to conceptualize and help them sort of educate, accept, understand the pathology that they're, they're, they're often dealing with. Our management approach uh, is sort of based on this notion of assume, then resume approach. Uh, tend to do that in three steps. Uh, we really take over the care, right? If you're, if you're, um, you know, if you're, if you're mentally ill, if, you, if you're seriously depressed, um, you know, you don't hold your bottle of lithium, right? We hold your bottle of lithium until you're no longer at risk. In this case, their their risk is holding their insulin, so we need to be very thoughtful about that. Um, then we switch into joint care, and eventually the goal is to transition care f responsibility fully back. Uh, to the patient when they're uh, physiologically and psychologically ready for that. Consistency in this treatment is imperative. Um, again, this is an illness that thrives in inconsistencies. Um, uh, we need to institute, whoever is managing this institute, uh, protocols for insulin management and blood glucose testing that are tight, kind of understanding with a, with a clear understanding of, of these behaviors and this pathology. Um, and we aim first at modest uh, glucose control. The, the notion is that just to treat their diabetes. So a lot of structure, um, really with the goal of getting these people to the point that they can manage their diabetes again, as most of them really know how. Um, expertise in, in a team that approaches this is important, both from you know, nutritional, medical, psychiatric, et cetera. Uh, diabetic retraining is quite controversial, right? Many of these folks have said, you know, I've had people look me in the eye and said, you know, I've lived with diabetes 40 years. I know more about diabetes than you do. I said, that's right, you do. However, we're going to start from the basics again. Um, and uh, this is fascinating to me. So here comes somebody with a glyco of 17%, right? You know what's been happening for a while. And they come into treatment, and they, they get absolutely obsessed with sort of the orthodiabetic management, right? So hypoglycemia is unacceptable. Hyperglycemia is unacceptable. So they're really mad because they're running 400. Well, you know, last week you ran 800 most of the time. You know, we're moving in the right direction. In their mindset, often not good enough. And families often join in this, right? It's been so ingrained, I think, that they often join in that sense. Um, we need to prepare them for the weight gain, right? We do that uh, carefully with people with anorexia. We need to do this just as carefully with people with the dual diagnosis. Uh, the, the group dynamics in a setting like mine, right, in which we have a milieu-based, group-based um, sort of treatment approach for eating disorders, right, uh, multi-diagnostic uh, eating disorders, the, these, are, these are what they tend to complain about. Alienation, I'm not like these other people. I, I'm not anorexic, right? 
uh, competition, it, you know, just like other eating disorders. I'm not thin enough. My blood glucose, you know, what I did to myself was not bad enough. Completely counterintuitive in a sense. And contagion, they learn stuff, um, you know, when they're exposed to, eat, you know, others with eating pathology. We hold no special foods for them. You know, we, we feed them uh, or, or help that they eat um, without sort of exclusion of foods unless it's absolutely indicated. Um, that we need to manage the whole notion of how they relate to exercise. And I mentioned this earlier, uh, we tend to start off an insulin pump, not on an insulin pump, and eventually uh, resume the pump. We actually have a protocol um, for them to petition for resumption of pump use. So it has to be by consensus and agreement rather than simply a, a decision made uh, just cause. So um, this is pathology, you know, type one. People with type one diabetes have more eating pathology than the general population. Um, I think that, that this is complex pathology where we have to deal with issues of impaired metabolic control, high risk of medical complications and high mortality rates. Um, and care I think should be offered in, in settings in which we are really prepared uh, to do that, and you know, most most children's hospitals have the luxury of having a you know a transdisciplinary approach and and having you know uh, different disciplines with expertise uh, come to the table. Uh, but there are other settings in which that's simply not the case, um, and, and that's important. I want to end uh, with a couple of practical considerations. Um, I, I alluded to this, and and the term uh, has been relative hypoglycemia, so the notion that these are patients that will become very symptomatic uh, when they're for hypoglycemia when they're hyperglycemic, right, and, and very counterintuitive, right? I was taught that, you know, when I feel like this, I need glucose, but if you're running a blood glucose of 400, you don't need glucose right now. So the symptoms are there, really hard for them to uh, accept that, and, and, and it seems like their brain just, just readjusts. Uh, with time. Uh, the other term is permissive hyperglycemia. I alluded to this. Uh, we don't, we, the, the goal is not to normalize, uh, you know, all blood glucose tomorrow morning. The goal is to sort of transition gradually towards adequate insulin use and adequate management of, um, of blood glucose. Uh, this is an example. This is part of how we track this. So these are the first three days of somebody's hospitalization. You know, their blood glucose is ranging from 500 to 120 or so, and, and they're all over the map. Uh, the following, the next three days, for this same individual, we don't, we don't see perfect uh, glycemic control, so we have a high of 300 uh, and a low of 75, but the reality is that, that the grouping begins to say, okay, we're beginning to have a handle on this. This is, this is going to work out, um, and, and I think that's important. Um, for us uh, at Eating Recovery Center, I'm going to sort of briefly touch on some of these. We have a comprehensive intake assessment. Uh, travel safety is clearly considered. On admission, we do medical, psychiatric, nutritional, psychological team assessments, individualized treatment plans, not missing sight of the core principles of eating disorder treatment, right? If you have chronic energy deficiency and you're underweight, those are core principles. It doesn't matter what your diagnosis is in my mind, right? If you don't support the neurobiology, uh, the process of change is just simply impaired, uh, if you will. And we have a level system. It's an A through D. Actually, we have an evaluation, 48 hours of evaluation, where, where everybody is on a pretty strict protocol. And then we move down. And you have to get um, uh, you know, closer to level B before you can petition for insulin pump. Uh, resumption, um, if you will. Um, I just want to touch on, a, on, on variances. So we're already, um, I mean, part of the beauty of my work is that, you know, our, our numbers are so significant that you begin to say, I, I'm learning. I'm learning. Um, and so we have a couple of interesting uh, phenomena that we're observing. One is the deliberate induction of hypoglycemia. So it's absolutely the opposite of this. People who make a commitment in their seeking of thinness to live on the edge of hypoglycemia. So my goal as a diabetic is that my glucose is just at 50. It's actually another important way of, uh, uh, you know, supporting weight loss. 
Um, the other one is, and we've seen this in, in um, young people with diabetes, is the justification to binge. They're so ashamed of binging, right, that if they overdose with insulin, they have no choice but to binge. So think about it. I'm not choosing to binge. I have no choice but to binge, right? That's a different mindset, if you will. And then we've run into a small group of patients that have self-injured actually directly with diabetic paraphernalia. So they, they cut and they stab, um, you know, um, because, uh, you know, I think really with, the, with a similar mindset as other uh, parasuicidal or self-injurious behaviors, but at the end of the day, it's quite concerning that their method of choice, right? So if they have an X blade, it's easy for me to say, well, you can't have that anymore. What do I tell these folks? Um, so that's, that's interesting. And then I, I wanted to end by, by sharing that the reality is, is that this is also the tip of the iceberg as far as medical comorbidity. So, you know, as you probably have, I have seen um, uh, young people with hypothyroidism overuse their thyroid hormone replacement, right? I've, I've seen a nurse take 2,000 micrograms of Synthroid a day. Now, that, that, that's in my eyes by like taking, uh, you know, 200 laxatives every day. Much of that is not at play, right? It doesn't get absorbed. It's not bioavailable. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive it, right? Um, uh, I've seen people uh, with hyperthyroidism withhold, intentionally withhold their tapazole and intentionally withhold their thyroid suppression to allow themselves to be hyperthyroid enough. Uh, the youngest person that I've seen do this was 14 years old. Think about that. Think about the sophistication of saying, if instead of taking it, if I'm supposed to take it, you know, three times a week, I'm going to take it once a week, right? Um, eating disorders and cystic fibrosis. So we've run into a couple of different uh, agendas here, and, and most of it is about not taking enzymes. And so if, my, if, my, uh, if I manipulate my digestive enzymes, I know that I malabsorb a bit of what I eat. Um, especially for binges. If I felt like I binged, that's important. Uh, people with inflammatory bowel disease manipulating their, their, their anti-inflammatory regimens, allowing enough inflammation, right, for enough fecal loss um, so, that, so that the nutrient intake is sort of uh, challenged, if you will. And these guys were not manipulating, but to me they're fascinating. So, um, you know, anorexia nervosa in a case of Turner's, I mean, you talk about sort of body image challenges, and, and very similarly with cerebral palsy, um, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a challenge. Um, so, but, you know, in my career, uh, these hadn't been around until recently, and now they are. Now, now we've had, uh, um, you know, several of each, uh, and that becomes important. If you're coming to Colorado and you come in the summer, um, you know, just be aware that we have critters, but you're welcome to come. You know, they say that in Colorado it's the winter that brings them, but it's the summer that keeps them. So um, if you're sending kids out there, watch them. They may not return. Um, and, uh, and with that, I want to thank you, and I think we have two or three minutes to entertain any questions that you might have. The management plan is a complex one. What's your success rate, both short-term and maybe long-term sustainability of this hospitalization? Um, what, what do you see and how much relapse do you see in this patient population? Sure. So I can only share our experience, um, in which, which is a challenge because, number one, when you're a when you're a national center, and I think you guys experience this, especially in an area like this, once you're done with your treatment, right, so the follow-up uh, monitoring that we do has to contend with a very diverse uh, set of circumstances that patients return to. So it's, it's back to fabulous care, right, at times, and it's to no care or very limited care at times, and that becomes a challenge. So, um, you know, if I had my way, we could structure a network in, in which everybody got um, adequate aftercare, it would be a much different paradigm. Generally speaking, these patients readmit to us at the same rate that other patients with eating disorders. So we have about a 25% readmission rate. 
over time. So that's not necessarily short term. That could be two years later, four years later. But we seem to now, in our you know eight year history, um, sort of clearly follow um, into that trend. And and we've seen because we have new sites that as sites mature we clearly sort of fall into that same pattern. So there must be something to the number. I don't understand fully why. And that doesn't mean that there are not patients that relapse that went elsewhere. I can only tell you about, you know, sort of our experience for that perspective. So I don't know that this is one time and all is well, because there is no eating disorder treatment in which there is one time and all is well. We also don't understand to what extent, the, you know, the, the sort of the impact or the shade of gray of this psychopathology, right? We don't understand the differences, so we don't know. So I meet somebody with uh, EDDM type one, right? And I don't know if they're a light shade of gray or a medium shade of gray or a dark shade of gray. We have no way to truly differentiate that. And, and typically presenting, the, the, the presenting uh, severity, if you will, does not necessarily inform outcomes. So there are milder presentations where the outcome is quite negative there are very serious presentations where the outcome is quite positive. So what that speaks to me is that we simply don't know how to stratify yet, which means it's really hard then to understand how do we, how do we begin to think about how to, how to best understand outcomes. I think we're at a point in this field, a lot like with bulimia and anorexia, where you know, we're implementing the little bit of evidence base that we have, the things that we know are our core features, um, and hoping for a good follow-up and that maturity actually plays an important role in, in sort of determining the course of outcome. But shy of that, I think we're simply not there yet. Can, can you um, say a few words about uh, prevention and uh, early uh, uh, diagnosis? You made the point that in the preteen age period, uh, the incidence was very low, but uh, later on much more. We, uh, Randy Streisand from our group has done a lot of work uh, in preteens with diabetes uh, to try and prevent them from not taking their insulin. Could something similar than that to that be used for this as well? Excellent point, and, and one that's very near and dear to my heart. Because in eating disorder, in eating pathology, the prevention efforts have really shifted towards more evidence-based approaches that really have little to do with psychoeducation and much more to do with self-esteem, self-acceptance, and sort of the acceptance of others, right? So the times of taking sort of a felon to the high school and saying, don't do like I did, this, this is not going to work for you, which clearly works for the vast majority of that, those kids that hear that message, but one or two of those say, that's my role model. Right? So I think we need to shift away from that. Now, I, I don't know how to couple this. I don't think that there is any data to say, how do I specifically message the whole notion of positive self-esteem, good self-acceptance, acceptance of others, especially the variability of size, shape, color, you name it, right? I think that's where prevention and eating disorders is. Where is prevention in this dual diagnosis? I don't know. My sense is that we need to really look at how are we teaching diabetic care? You know, how do we go about this whole notion? And are we incorporating well-being, not just good diabetic management? Thank you. 